we really appreciate apologies for the technical problems as I mentioned this did not happen in the test but thank you very much for sticking with us we really appreciate it um, and I think it's gonna be very worthwhile it's a great presentation we've got lined up here so my name is Darla Saunders and on behalf of the Atlantic Salmon Conservation Foundation and the Canadian Rivers Institute I would like to officially welcome you to the eighth in our webinar series. Uh, this webinar series is made possible in part thanks to the contributions of the Government of Canada and the New Brunswick Environmental Trust Fund. So we're very fortunate today to be hosting Chris Hunter. Chris is a fisheries biologist with almost 15 years experience working in fisheries research and fisheries management across the country. He is the Vice President of Habitat Unlimited and is currently a master's candidate in biology at St. FX where he is studying the effects of river restoration on the fish and invertebrate communities. Before we get started, just a couple of very quick housekeeping matters for those of you that it's your first time participating in one of these webinars. We're going to save our questions until the end of the presentation. To ask a question, you can use your webinar control panel. That's a little gray box you should be seeing in your upper right-hand corner of your screen. If the box is minimized, you can hit the orange arrow to enlarge it. If you're using the audio of your computer, you can actually raise your hand. It's a little uh, yellow hand icon with a green arrow. Um, and Michelle will unmute you and you can ask a question to Chris directly. Or you can type in your question in the control panel and Michelle will read it aloud to you uh, during the question and answer session. Finally, you can also email me questions and I could read them aloud for you. So again, my email address is Darla, D-A-R-L-A, at salmonconservation.ca. So I'm now, hopefully, going to turn the webinar over to Chris. Chris, are you there? Okay, uh, I see that. His... Oh, we... wonderful. Yep, are we okay? No echoes or anything? Oh, you sound terrific. Excellent, okay. So let's, uh, let's get this up and running. And apologize for the delay. And let's. Oh, oh, now my computer decides it's frozen. Lovely. PowerPoint has completely crashed. Yay. So now you can see me fight with the PowerPoint. In process. In process. Chris, if you like, we could go back to having Michelle. Uh, no, I just forward just slides for you. Second, and I think it'll work fine. I think it was okay. a little add in that uh, didn't quite work correctly. There we go. All right, off we go. Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, I'll be uh, talking today about uh, work that I'm doing uh, as part of my master's research. Uh, it basically looks at the effect of restoration on um, on community structure of both the fish and the invertebrate community structure uh, in a northern Nova Scotia stream. Um, this work was done in conjunction uh, with uh, St. Francis Xavier University under the supervision of uh, Dr. Barry Taylor, uh, Charles McGinnis at the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, and uh, a local nonprofit organization, uh, Habitat Unlimited. Um, so, just before I, I get into the actual specifics of the talk, um, let's try that there. Uh, I uh, just want to give you a little bit of a background about why why we'd be interested in river restoration at all. So, uh, just from a perspective with the of, of Nova Scotia alone. Uh, we know that river restoration really got kicked off in Nova Scotia with work done by Bob Rutherford and uh, Charles McGuinness uh, in the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, and this has really developed up into uh, the uh, end of that has developed this, this Nova Scotia Salmon Association, Nova Scotia Liquor Corporation Adopt a Stream program. This has really come out of that work. Uh, and to date, we've, there's that, that program has funded over 40 different groups. Uh, and you can see some of the stats there, over 75,000 trees. And they're, they're restoring about 200,000 square meters a year So uh, through that program. Uh, and in addition to that program, there are many other programs out there as well. So the Atlantic Salmon Conservation Foundation uh, funds projects in Nova Scotia, as does uh, EcoAction, Sage Environmental, and several others. So the, really, the, the, what I'm trying to impress upon you is that there is currently lots of restoration work being done on that. Uh, and it's almost entirely based on that original work done by uh, Bob Rutherford and Charles McGuinness. One of the groups that's doing on it, as I've already alluded to, it is a, is a local nonprofit group here in Antigonish, uh, Habitat Unlimited. Uh, now, this group has uh, been around for about 20, it's 20 years now. Uh, it, it was actually founded and actually is continuing the work that was initially started by, uh, by Bob and Charlie. Um, that work uh, is not only just the straight restoration work, but also sort of the research and the investigation side as well, which makes Habitat Unlimited a bit of a different uh, uh, 
nonprofit organization and that they do partner with Sanovax and do, do a fair bit of research. Um, all of this is sort of uh, becoming uh, fresh because not only are we doing a lot of it, but with recent changes to uh, the salmon stocks on the eastern seaboard, uh, restoration is really being looked at as a possible way, way forward. So uh, just to give a, a very brief summary of what I'm, what I'm alluding to here is, is that uh, the Eastern Seaboard, of course, has experienced uh, declines across the board um, in its salmon stocks. Uh, some areas have obviously been harder hit than others. The Gulf is, of Nova Scotia is doing relatively okay, uh, but other regions such as the Southern Uplands or the Inner Bay of Fundy, uh, the, the species are actually have become, are, are listed or are becoming listed as endangered. So uh, with that, uh, people have been looking at the causes, uh, it's which is generally accepted as Etsy mortality, but uh, where this leads back to restoration is is that people are are are, are thinking the way forward is to try and um, maximize in-stream production, and so restoration is being looked at. So really, what 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 I'm trying to prove or just, just demonstrate here is that there's lots of restoration being work done, uh, and uh, it looks like there's going to be even more done in the future. So uh, it is very important, therefore, for us to understand the principle behind restoration and uh, exactly what's happening in terms of um, what's happening in terms of the the restoration uh, and what the exact effects are okay so that's really all I'm trying to go with that there um, so if we look at the literature to see what has been done uh, in this field uh, we see generally most of the studies are, are quite positive towards restoration so we have the initial work that was done by Charles McGinnis and Bob Rutherford uh, it was published in 1994 looking at uh, uh, the basically showing positive effects, increases in rearing areas for juveniles, and there's been several others through the years uh, since. <laughs> um, so generally quite positive along, all, down along the, along the board, and that's just of course a subset of what's been out, been out there. But of course you never have anything that's perfectly positive, so uh, through the years there's been a few papers that Although not really uh, condemning restoration, not suggesting that restoration, river restoration shouldn't be done, uh, they have been calling into question some of the claims made by restoration or uh, questioning the, the mechanism by which we see restoration being done. Uh, so uh, I've just sort of once again put a little uh, subset up there, but uh, we see uh, Riley and Falk, they were really claiming, they were concerned that uh, some of the, the, uh, the increases in community and usage was possibly due to uh, immigration. Roni and Quinn worried whether or not uh, there might be some movement impairment to, especially to other species. Uh, so every once in a while, I'm getting a beep there. I'm not sure why, why I'm getting that, but anyway, okay. Um, studying it all, that, this was a very interesting one. Uh, they actually did a meta-analysis uh, of a bunch of different restoration programs, and uh, they found that, uh, or they raised concerns that a lot of groups out there doing restoration really weren't connecting with the underlying ecological processes that they were just um, um, that they were doing the restoration work uh, but didn't necessarily connect it uh, back to uh, limiting factors and and, uh, and actually trying to improve the underlying ecological process and thus uh, the ecosystem uh, and then very recently Langford et al uh, in 2012 uh, they did some work in, in Scotland and they're actually wondering about or sorry uh, in England and uh, they were wondering about um, uh, they were seeming to find impacts a lot of other species, so non salmonids and, and uh, that, that, that didn't seem uh, to benefit from, from various forms of restoration. Um, the other sort of uh, the other sort of one is actually coming out of my my own lab in that uh, one of the things that we're finding, curiously enough, is, is that the invertebrate community, the benthic invertebrates, uh, are not responding uh, to uh, to this river restoration. Uh, we would expect that they should. Uh, because increasing the uh, stability of the stream, uh, increasing the health of the river, uh, should, as a result, uh, increase uh, the benthic invertebrate community should respond to that. Uh, and uh, we didn't really find they're not really finding a response. Now this is a bit of in contrast to what Harris uh, found in '95. Uh, he found actually positive effects to the invertebrate community. So certainly there's some questions there anyway. So. Uh, and as I said, these aren't really negative on it, but just calling into question exactly how we do it and, and whether or not we're doing restoration in the right way, or do we fully understand what's happening when we do it. If we look at the studies, we can sort of break them down into uh, three general categories. Most of the studies out there are actually how-to guides or what I call technique validations, where somebody is attempting some new type of restoration and, and they just are trying to validate that uh, 
that the community respond, the fish community typically, the Salmonic community has responded uh, positively to that. So that's generally most of them, they're not actually exploring uh, underlying uh, scientific principles. Um, the sort of second category that we see in previous studies is uh, hydrology. Um, so there's a lot of that sort of take on more very uh, earth sciences or geological sort of basis. Uh, these are connected with sediment transport, but mostly with uh, flood references. Uh, so control of flooding, uh, the effects that, that are caused by flooding and stuff like that. So that is that sort of another sort of major category uh, in the literature. And then the third category that we see is, uh, is biological in nature. So these are uh, ecology. Uh, there's a heavy salmon and trout emphasis so, uh, and, and, and sport fish emphasis, I guess I could say, uh, on, on, these, on these sort of works. Uh, there has been some work done, but really not a lot on invertebrates and um, little to no work on what I would call the bait fishes. So essentially your non-sport fish, your, uh, your minnows, your dace, uh, your sticklebacks, your chubs, etc. So, um, uh, so that's sort of, a, sort of a, a very brief overview of where we are at with, with what we know and we don't know in terms of literature or where, where we're, we're focusing our literature. So if we, we look at that literature, we, we, we can definitely find a few knowledge gap areas. Um, very often we don't know what is currently limiting our streams, uh, either uh, on a local basis or on a uh, sort of a regional level basis. So uh, the current limitations, is it still physical habitat? Should we still be applying physical habitat restoration? Uh, or uh, have, we, have we remediated that and we have some other limitation that's, that's, that's bigger? So uh, current limitations uh, is certainly one area that's uh, lacking. Uh, a little bit in the in the in the literature, uh, the specific effects of restoration. What exactly are we causing? Uh, there's been some work done on this uh, sediment of proportions and stuff like that, but uh, uh, there's still uh, still a lot to be answered there in terms of what's exactly happening. Uh, what's going on with the invertebrates in restoration? Uh, basically, we're finding mixed results: some positive, some uh, that uh, saying the invertebrates are not responding. Uh, so the question is, is, what's the connection there? What's going on? Why is it responding here and not there? Um, are we truly seeing stream bed stabilization? Uh, are we uh, are the materials moving uh, at a rate that's concomitant with a natural system, uh, or are they moving uh, and still at an accelerated or, or decelerated rate? So, uh, are we uh, are the underlying sort of movement or hydrology of materials, uh, certain hydrology, but the underlying uh, movement of the stream bed is that uh, is that uh, is that decreasing, uh, stabilizing, uh, coming more into the equilibrium that we would expect in, in a natural healthy system? Uh, and lastly, uh, is, there a, is there a connection between basically the geological and the biological? So uh, there's not been a lot of work done in that area, and, and this is something that uh, is, uh, if we want to get at understanding from an ecosystem management perspective, uh, when we're trying to promote certain ecological processes, that, that, that certainly needs to be firmed up. So, so we have lots of questions. Well, uh, any of you that worked uh, in science know that you always have lots of questions. Uh, it's about finding opportunities to, to answer those. So uh, we had those questions um, in uh, 2009, 2008, 2009, uh, and when the opportunity came along. Uh, the opportunity uh, in this case was um, a, the highway bypass around Anganish. So in the map that you see up here, this was just taken from one of the planning sessions. Uh, this is for the new uh, twin highway coming around Anganish, so that's in purple. Okay, the existing Highway 104 is here. I don't know if you can follow my mouse, but it's along right there. The town of Anaganesh is right here. The Gulf of Nova Scotia is, is uh, due north. Cape Breton would uh, be off uh, here to the, to the right side of the screen. So uh, this, is, this is an opportunity because when they built this highway, when they're build, as they're building this highway, uh, they had to, uh, it was unavoidable that they would have to destroy uh, some, uh, some fish habitat. You can see the blue lines here of all the, the streams and, and wetlands that uh, that were impacted by this uh, by this uh, infrastructure expansion, uh, and so under the uh, the at least the old terms of the Fisheries Act, uh, the habitat destruction had to be compensated, and so uh, Nova Scotia Transportation Infrastructure Renewal uh, was uh, compensating. They were they were going to pay uh, Habitat Limited to do uh, some restoration work, uh, but they required a monitoring plan. So that that's what actually that work uh, and the monitoring plan was what formed the backbone study and allowed for me to be hired. Um, so based on this we decided to try and refine it down to a few sort of more specific research questions. One uh, for uh, this stream here that we're, that, we're, that we're studying, and I'll show you the exact stream here in a second, is physical habitat uh, limiting? 
is that still still a concern, or has our 20 years of work uh, really alleviated that 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 issue? Uh, we want to know is the fish community uh, energy limited? So if they're not physical habitat limited, is there an energy limitation? Something having to connection with the benthic invertebrate community. Uh, and uh, lastly, we want to know what's happening with the benthic invertebrates because, uh, as I said, the previous work that's uh, that we're sort of working on now is, seems to suggest that they're not responding. So are they limited? Uh, by physical habitat, or is there some other factor at play here? Is it uh, substrate stability, uh, the ability of the system to retain uh, leaf litter uh, and thus energy for the benthic vertebrates, uh, or is there a litter colonization issue? So uh, those were sort of our research questions. Uh, based on that, uh, came up with a series of hypotheses, sort of the main four that I'll, that I'll allude to or discuss in this, uh, in this presentation are here. Um, Restoration basically should increase the, the the amount of available habitat. So as we increase the habitat, uh, as we restore the system, we would expect uh, using our standard measures to see increases in habitat for some monids. Uh, I use, as I said, using standard standard measures. Uh, we would expect that if we restore these new reaches, that um, we would see local increases in uh, fish fish populations. So the fish community should respond positively. Uh, is our hypothesis and that we would see increased numbers uh, in fish uh, in and around uh, these areas that we restored. Uh, restoration will decrease the rate of sediment transport and we should see an increase in uh, leaf, leaf, leaf litter. So um, if we are working to stabilize the movement of the stream back to more of a normal equilibrium uh, of erosion deposition, then we would expect that the uh, sediment transport, or we're guessing that the sediment transport rate would de will decline. Uh, and that uh, leaf litter should 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 increase because uh, it won't be removed from the system, won't be chewed up as fast uh, by the turning over of the substrates. And lastly, uh, the hypothesis is that the invertebrate biodiversity should increase uh, after restoration as well. So here's the specific study site. Um, this is as I alluded to before. It's done just outside of uh, the town of Anaganesh here in northern Nova Scotia. The stream in, of interest is Briarley Brook. The same system that uh, Bob Rutherford and Charles McGinnis did the original work in. Uh, so we can see here this runs along here. This is the existing Highway 104. The town of Anaganish is just up here in the upper right hand corner. Uh, the, there's a wetland right here uh, that I've highlighted, and it's right through along the edge of this wetland that's the, where the new highway was, was, was put. So the new uh, divided highway is right there. So this was. Uh, showed over wintering habitat that was lost, and then there was, of course, uh, erosion and, uh, and sedimentation issues uh, affecting the streams down, uh, affecting Barley Brook as the streams into Barley Brook here. So uh, the restored site was uh, downstream of, uh, of, the, of that wetland uh, in this region here. It's, it's old pasture land, uh, and it was very, very actively uh, eroding. Uh, our control site is near a farm uh, just upstream of that, that location. Uh, so just a few pictures here to show you what the site was looking like uh, before um, before we we started the restoration and the monitoring. So this is uh, one of near one of our, our uh, one of the pools on the sites that was going to be monitored and rest restored and monitored. Uh, you can see the bank over here on the left on the left side of the screen is actively eroding. And just to give you the rate of which that erosion was occurring, I mean you can see there's new new grass there, so it's it's eroding quite quickly. But uh, when we were planning this study in the fall of 2008, uh, we came out and we assessed this site as a potential candidate site for restoration. This tree, this tree you can see here, was actually on the far bank. So the river was actually running where the stream is, and this was over on the, on the bank over there. So uh, quite, quite active in terms of the erosion because this picture was taken six months later uh, in June. So you can see you know, we've lost uh, almost four meters of stream bank there. It's, so it was eroding very, very quickly. Uh, far, far greater than uh, you would expect in, in a natural system. So this is just a shot slightly upstream. This is at, uh, at, at one of our study pools, uh, what, we, what we call pool one. Uh, you can see that the bank is, is uh, slumping inwards uh, and uh, you can see the pool down here. It's not very deep. Uh, it came in at about uh, 35 centimeters before, uh, beforehand at, at low flow. So it's not a very deep, deep pool. Uh, this is another shot. It's just uh, upstream of uh, our of a riffle, our study riffle. One of our study riffles, uh, riffle two, was actually just downstream of this picture, so just lower to the left. Uh, but you can see how over widened the stream is here. Uh, and, uh, we should be looking at a design width of about four and a quarter meters uh, for this stream. So the width of the stream should be about four and a quarter meters, and, and, and we're up here 
uh, I think uh, the number off the top of my head, I think it measures at something like uh, at uh, 11 meters or, or something like that. It was just over 10 meters anyway. Uh, it was over 10 meters anyways uh, for the width of the stream there. So uh, quite, quite over widened and, and a very, very active system for sure. So what was our design? How did we actually go about uh, doing this? Uh, we basically used a before after uh, reference uh, approach uh, that we looked at um, the system before we did the restoration uh, for a year uh, and then we looked at it after we did the restoration for two years and this was done at, uh, at that uh, treatment or restored site and also at the uh, control or, or reference site as well. Uh, within each site, uh, we did sort of visual assessments on the on the whole system, uh, but uh, we we in, we looked at two riffles and two pools uh, in particular. So we had a total of four pools in the whole system and four riffles that we sort of monitored sort of uh, more closely. Um, <clears throat> and those were chosen to be representative of the sort of habitat uh, types that we were seeing uh, along the whole reach. Um, so what did we do? Uh, one of the first things we did was just basically use uh, all the standard measures for established for quantifying stream morphology. So we went through, we looked at temperature, pH, um, size of pools, depth of pools, uh, riffle to run ratios, uh, sinuosity, those sort of measures. We made all those you know, standard measures uh, at both those sites before and after. Uh, we then went through and quantified the uh, fish community. Uh, we did this uh, twice a year. We did it in June, just after the uh, spring migrations, uh, and again in August during the sort of the low flow flow periods uh, of the summer. Uh, we did the assessments uh, using the regression method. That is to say, we, we netted off uh, a region of the stream, uh, and uh, we went through and sampled it uh, multiple times uh, and got sort of a declining return that we could use to back calculate and figure out what the, the fish population was. We used two different methods uh, just to optimize catch efficiencies. So on the riffle runs, we used uh, electrofishing and uh, we used seining in the pools uh, just to make sure that we're getting the most optimal, um, opt optimal uh, I guess, catch efficiencies. In the first year, we also tried some real basic catch per unit effort stuff, just minnow traps, essentially leaving them out for, for set, out, set uh, time frames. Um, this was mainly just to see if we were missing anything with our other sampling. So these were minnow traps were positioned elsewhere in the reaches. Uh, and uh, after the first year, uh, we realized that we weren't actually catching uh, very much of anything and nothing different or in any different proportions than we were uh, uh, with our other methods. So this was, this was stopped after, after the first year. Uh, in addition to the fish community, we also quantified the invertebrate biodiversity. Uh, so we did this using a modified Hess sampler. Uh, three minute samples. Uh, we sampled each of the two study uh, riffles, so uh, and each riffle was sampled uh, three times. So, uh, and then we made did that sampling twice a year. We did it in uh, June and December to get the uh, the two closure periods uh, for for the system. Um, then, uh, because we, we do want to connect back to the underlying uh, geological processes, we did uh, quantify some of the sediment transport. Okay. Uh, we did quantify uh, the sediment transport. Now, we did this in actually um, uh, sort of three different ways to quantify what was happening with the substrates. Uh, the, um, the first method uh, we used was sediment traps. So we, we buried, um, we established two transects uh, on our riffles, uh, and we buried three sediment traps on each uh, riffle, and uh, we would actually capture sediment as it was moving downstream. So from this, we could figure displacement rates by filling how fast the, the jars were filling. Uh, and then uh, by removing that material, we could run a mean particle size and organic composition test to, to figure out what, what, uh, what type of material was moving and, and what size. Uh, now the sediment traps uh, are very good for small uh, set, set, sediments and substrates, but they're they're not going to get the larger material movements. Uh, so to assess that at these two transects that we established um, on uh, on the riffles, uh, we also put in um, uh, bricks uh, of different sizes and known weights. Uh, so we actually had um, three different weights, uh, three times each, so nine bricks in total. Uh, that we had put out uh, along the transects, and then we simply uh, monitored them over the summer to see how much uh, how much they moved uh, over time. Uh, and then, lastly, uh, to quantify what was happening with the substrate, we used uh, quadrat assessments uh, along these transects as well. Uh, we did that 
that uh, once a year just to see what was happening with the uh, with the relative proportions of, of sediment that were that we were seeing in the stream. In addition to these sort of uh, quantification methods, we also did a few experimental manipulations. Um, the first was is uh, we did a leaf loading experiment. So um, essentially, all we did here is we put out uh, a, a little trap that we could load up with uh, various concentrations of leaf litter um, uh, uh, to see what effect that would have on the benthic invertebrate community. So we monitored the, um, the benthic invertebrate community within the trap and out before and after the loading, uh, and uh, we just saw if there was any response. The, the basic premise here is is that. If the benthic invertebrates are nutrient limited, that if we were to provide them with nutrients, that we should see uh, an increase in uh, in biomass as a result of that loading. So we did that at several different levels, and, and so that was the that's the loading experiment. In addition to that, we also looked at some uh, litter retention uh, work as well, uh, where we looked to see if uh, if there was any uh, litter retention in restored versus unrestored areas. If there's any differences uh, that had. Uh, so just a few pictures of the doing the work. So uh, this is the the crew taking a, uh, I guess it's a lunch break. I don't, I don't know. They seem to take take a number of breaks from time to time. But anyway, so this is my restoration crew uh, and uh, the our DFO uh, supervisor of the day. Uh, we're uh, just taking a bit of a break at that 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 first site. Now, as my supervisor says, this is just another another example of governance propping up failing banks. So you can groan at that one to your own your own pleasure. Um, this is just an example of, of the fish assessments. So this is uh, at uh, our most downstream riffle. Uh, so we can see we netted off the area and then we used electrofishing several times to to uh, to uh, get a, a drop in the, the number of fish and then from there we could estimate the fish population. Uh, this is just an example of the guys doing the work. So you can see now we've, we've uh, that this is after the that eroding bank has been rocked uh, now this was, it's not just been rocked, it actually was designed uh, to uh, break up the downstream flow or the, the erosive force of the, that was occurring uh, and redirect it down, downwards to dig, dig pools. So, uh, and then we put in some uh, kickers and, and, and boulder groupings for, for cover as well. So, uh, so this wasn't, uh, this is done, uh, it was carefully designed by uh, habitat biologists before uh, as we did this. Uh, and then you can see the crew here putting in uh, a bigger log as well to help uh, try and uh, hold up this riffle and uh, build that pool down below. Uh, and then this is just out on the reference site, uh, once again, the fish the, doing the fish assessments. So what did we find? Um, the results, basically, if we go through in terms of our standard measures uh, at the uh, reference site, there was no changes. Uh, we didn't have any changes in pool size, distribution, uh, not, not, no real significant changes anywhere uh, throughout the reference site. At the restored site, uh, O2 and pH remained stable. They were, they were always uh, sufficient values, so there's no, no times of real concern there. So, but there, there was no changes either. Uh, we did see there was creation of two new pools, so two pools that were not in that, that reach uh, beforehand uh, were, were established. Uh, one of which was established right at the, the top end of one of my electrofishing sites, and we actually ended up having to move the electrofishing site downstream a few meters so that we were still in um, in proper riffle habitat and, and not in pool because the pool actually encroached on, on, on that site. Uh, another existing pool, that pool one, actually doubled in its length, and five ex uh, of the uh, extant pools uh, increased by their depth by at least 25 uh, centimeters. So uh, as I alluded to earlier, uh, the pool, at least that pool one I said was at uh, 35. They basically, the pools ranged at uh, 30 to, uh, to about 40 uh, centimeters deep uh, during low flow period. Uh, and afterwards, they were, yeah, they were consistently coming in during low flow uh, at uh, around 70 centimeters. Some were, were even more substantial. One in particular, uh, one of actually one of our study pools, uh, it actually deepened uh, by to over a meter deep uh, during, during the low flow period, so it's a, it's actually a really nice pool. In addition, we saw stabilizations of uh, several gra uh, gravel bars. One in particular, uh, it was uh, coming in uh, at uh, it was consistently at a wet what it had a wet width of about eight meters, uh, and then in the, the last year it was down to about four meters wet width, uh, and um, 
uh, we saw the establishment of herbaceous vegetation, which hadn't been noted on that on that particular graphic graph bar before. And this was right next to one of our study sites, so uh, that's why we mentioned this one in particular. But certainly, we were seeing some uh, improvements to to habitat under uh, a lot of our standard measures. And lastly, as we were doing our depth profiles as part of our standard measures, uh, we saw that um, the thaw white position uh, seemed to be uh, quite stable, um, stable in response to the. Um, Um, so this is just uh, the temperature data for uh, the, the six different, uh, the two different reaches, the restored and the controlled uh, for the three different years. Um, this is mainly just to give you a, an impression of sort of what was happening. So you can see in some years we definitely were getting uh, quite warm and other years we were quite cool. When we, we plot out a sort of an average of the, the mean daily temperature, uh, we see that a uh, couple things. First off, that the restored sites here in the, the lighter colored bars uh, were consistently uh, warmer than the, the reference site, uh, both before restoration and even after restoration, um, uh, and that there was significant difference between years. So as the years progressed, we actually were getting cooler. Uh, 2009 was a particularly warm year, and then uh, we had cooler, cooler summers in 2010 and 2011. Uh, of interesting note here, though, is, is that if we look at the slope of these lines, uh, we see that uh, the, the rate of cooling on the restored site was actually greater than the rate of cooling. So it's a significant difference between um, uh, restored and reference uh, with respect to, to the year. So uh, that certainly is a, a nice positive sign. Now we did have a few uh, confounding variables. Uh, the most notable one uh, was um, uh, occurred in that marsh. So as you were, as we were, um, as I set up where the study site was, I showed you where that marsh was, where the highway was coming in. Uh, we were doing an assessment on that marsh as part of a, another study. And uh, what we found uh, was is that there was a fair, fairly substantial amount of suspended sediment being produced uh, when we calculated the rate of that suspended sediment. And you can see, you can see that here. Uh, you know, there was definitely plumes of it. Uh, when we calculated that out, uh, it was uh, 60 metric tons of suspended sediment per year was, was the rate at which that was being produced. So, uh, and unfortunately, of course, that is uh, between our reference and, and our restored site. So that was coming into our system uh, just upstream of where we were. So that's a bit of a, certainly a bit of a confounding variable that would have had, had some sort of an effect. Uh, if we look at our fish densities, uh, uh, we found lots of significant differences. There was significance between species, uh, between species at the different reaches, at the restored and reference reach, uh, before and after restoration, uh, and uh, between species at the reaches before and after restoration. So those were all significant differences. If we want to sort of look at a summary of it, what we see is that uh, Atlantic salmon density increased after restoration, both at the restored and reference sites, and overall. Uh, so we did see uh, increase there, which was uh, certainly uh, we viewed as a positive sign. Um, but the increase was was greater uh, at uh, at the reference site than it was at the at the restored. So uh, I think I said these are, these are all expressed as fish densities per per hundred square meters. So we definitely saw a, a greater increase uh, in terms of the brook trout, uh, and that's what I mean by brook trout. There was no brown trout in this particular. We never caught any brown trout in this system. Uh, the brook trout that we captured, we saw a uh, it, uh, the density almost halved after restoration at the restored site, but it doubled uh, at the reference site after restoration. So that, that's sort of an interesting sort of result as well. We did see, uh, in terms of the minnow community, and I have just sort of lumped here uh, the sticklebacks, uh, the dazed, uh, and the creatures uh, all in together, we did see a major decrease uh, after restoration at the restored site. And we were much higher at the restored site than we were at the reference site. And we believe that this is just a, a factor of the, uh, of the height above tide. Uh, the closer you are to the tide, of course, the, the greater number of minnows you would expect to find, a uh, greater number of suckers. Uh, so in terms of the absolute difference, uh, in terms of numbers, uh, that wasn't particularly concerning. But uh, we did see this large drop in uh, the minnow community, the minnow densities. Um, now. As you're going to see here in a second, we did break this out into usage in terms of the riffles and the pools, and uh, we, we definitely can, can see where that, that difference comes from, different habitat usage uh, in the pools and riffles. So we'll talk a little bit more about that major drop in minnows here in a second. Uh, and suckers, there was no effect on suckers, whatever. 
Uh, we took, we did this, we did uh, measurements on all the fish as well, and that size analysis is still ongoing. I'm still uh, doing that. So, uh, in addition to this, the absolute numbers, we'll actually also be able to comment uh, on the uh, what's happening with the, with the relative distribution of different species. So the interesting effects that we did get is, is when we plot the uh, density of uh, non salmonids against the uh, salmonids of salmon and trout, uh, we, we come up with an interesting, interesting density uh, relationship curve. So, uh, certainly at uh, lower salmonid densities, uh, the density of, of uh, non salmonids was low. And then we sort of reach an optimum, which sort of spikes around approximately around 75 uh, fish. Salmonids per hundred square meter, uh, which seems to optimize the density of other fish. Uh, beyond that, it sort of tailors off, and we tend to move back into a uh, salmonid dominated system. Uh, if we look at the riffles, uh, essentially we saw increases across the board. Uh, and that's that's really what was significant here is that uh, before and after restoration, uh, at both the restoric and reference, we saw increases in uh, in all categories of fish, all species of fish across the board. So riffle density certainly uh, certainly increased. Uh, we ran a plot there to see if it would also show a relationship, and it certainly does, but it is a, is a much lower uh, density for the optimum, so uh, down around uh, 25, uh, 30 uh, some odds per square meter seems to give us our optimum. In terms of our pool densities, um, what we see is, is that uh, we got a lot of variety of significant differences. Um, now, there was no significant difference before and after restoration, or between species before and after restoration, However, these were sort of, you would probably call these marginal. Like the p-values for before and after restoration was uh, 0.11, and the p-value between species before and after restoration was 0.09. So certainly we're at uh, marginal uh, in terms of the significance, but uh, uh, we didn't find a significant difference for sure. Um, we did get significant differences uh, when we start looking at uh, between species, between reaches, species out reaches, reaches before and after restoration. Uh, those were all significant. In a large part, these were driven, uh, numbers were driven by this uh, substantial drop in the numbers uh, after restoration. Uh, now, when, when we went back and looked at the data, we see that this, this really high density that we get of 270 uh, minnows uh, per 100 square meters, uh, we see that it was really driven by uh, two catches uh, in August of 2009 beforehand. At uh, the restored site, we, we sort of hit a school of, you know, of uh, sticklebacks. Uh, we caught 512 sticklebacks in the pool and 130 sticklebacks in the pool. So, uh, and then those were very, very warm days. So, um, certainly uh, that, that had influence on the summer and has driven this up to a fairly large density. If we were to take that out, that's something we want to do for, for conclusions just because we have so few before, before data samples. Uh, but uh, if we take it out, then certainly the numbers become. That changes a lot of the significances and the overall densities and relationships. Uh, if we look just at the salmonids and trout, uh, we see that um, that the density increased uh, once again. The last salmon increased after um, uh, restoration, at both reference, but once again it increased uh, more substantially uh, after restoration. Uh, perhaps suggesting uh, that uh, the improvement is allowed for greater mobility. Of the species, and they're able to move higher up the stream. Um, in terms of the brook trout, uh, we did see some decreases uh, at restored and increases at reference uh, as before, uh, but uh, here in the pool densities, we did see a slight uh, decline in the overall uh, numbers of trout. So that was sort of something to be aware of as well. And once again, when we plot the sort of the salmonid density against non salmonid density, uh, we find that the research does seem to be sort of an optimum salmon density to achieve uh, maximum biodiversity. Uh, in this case, around 125 uh, salmon per 100 square meters seems to be roughly our, our maximum. Um, we're running a little short on time, so uh, I'll just uh, sort of go things. The results for the invertebrates, that analysis is continuing. Uh, sediment transport, uh, using the quadrat methods, we did see uh, the emergence of some boulder near the end of the study, so uh, there was a slight shift, uh, decrease in the sand content and, and a slight increase in the boulder content uh, after restoration. In terms of the sediment traps, uh, before restoration, the um, sediment traps were filling uh, twice as quickly uh, as the uh, reference site. Uh, 
uh, and then that disappeared, uh, and they were the same rate uh, after restoration. So that was certainly a good sign. And the large substrate movements, uh, we were seeing um, uh, more large substrate movements. This was using the, the BRICS as an analysis, uh, but we're still working on, on how to best present that analysis so that uh, generally I can say the trend was is to see uh, a decrease in large substrate movement, uh, but that was uh, still not uh, still ongoing. And, and of course, the detailed sediment analysis on the size, particle size distribution and organic content, uh, that analysis is actually also still ongoing. Uh, basically, just because we're running short on time, I won't talk about what we're getting on this one, the preliminary analysis, but uh, it's more or less ongoing, the leaf, leaf, leaf litter loading experiments. Uh, but you can see here the traps that I was alluding to, and so these would have been loaded at different densities, and then we sampled in the traps, outside the traps, uh, over time. Some of the traps were uh, remained open as well to allow fish access, so we could look at the presence of, of uh, fish uh, and the effect that had on So in general, what are my conclusions? Well, in terms of habitat, uh, we successfully saw the creation of new habitat. Using our standard measures uh, under those definitions, we got uh, improvements to extant habitat, and we, we, we had new pools created. So we, were, we definitely saw uh, creation of, of salmonid-based uh, habitat. In terms of the fish utilization, uh, we can positively say that we saw changes in distribution of fish within the stream. Uh, in generally, the salmonids increased, uh, the minnows decreased uh, and the suckers were remained stable. The overall population of trout uh, was more or less stable as well. So that's generally what we can say that were our general trends and conclusions there. Uh, very interestingly though we found that relationship between salmonid and non-salmonid de density uh, and so there seems to be uh, some sort of optimum for biodiversity and that has uh, very important implications for um, restoration management and strategy development. Uh, that we want to make sure that we are, if our, if our aim or our goal of restoration is to maximize biodiversity, as many groups say that it is, uh, then we should be uh, actually targeting a specific salmon density. Um, unfortunately, I, we can't make a lot of really strong conclusions about the, um, the, the cell and the fish utilization because of our confounding variables and, and, and some of the trends. Uh, but I, one of the things that we believe is, is that if we saw, if we have a longer data set, uh, that we would get. Uh, to certainly see uh, that would help us make that conclusion better. So that's one of the conclusions we have here is that this work really does need to be continued so that we can uh, we can actually get a, a more uh, stable trend. Uh, and then lastly, we we uh, we can conclude that we saw differences in habitat utilization. So there was definitely differences in terms of the uh, the species and composition uh, between pools and pool habitats. Uh, and so there's there's definitely something uh, worth exploring there as well. In terms of the sediment transport restoration, uh, we did see increases in particle size as estimated by the, the quadrant method. Uh, we did see a reduction in uh, material movement and coarse material movement, uh, but there's still a lot, a lot of work to do. We can make a final analysis on that. And lastly, the litter retention and invert biodiversity. That analysis is uh, still ongoing. So where does that leave us here now? Uh, well, we still basically have to, I have to finish off the invertebrate and substrate analysis. Um, we need a little bit more information on some of the specific habitat types and, and utilizations. Um, more work needs to be, definitely we think more work needs to be done on non-salmonids because there certainly is a, a connection there with restoration uh, and uh, that biodiversity optima needs to be investigated. Uh, as I was alluding to in my conclusions, uh, we certainly need a longer data set in order to uh, draw more definitive conclusions about what's happening with response to re re restoration. Now we're fortunate that this has actually uh, been begun. There's a 10-year study being done by the Nova Scotia uh, Department of Fisheries and Agriculture, Inland Fisheries Division, uh, that they're looking at uh, five years before restoration, five years after, in, in a similar sort of design. So we're, we're going to get that long-term data set to help uh, draw those, those, those conclusions, which is nice. And uh, especially with the trout, we were, we we're wondering there with uh, the changes that we were seeing, the shift from the restored up to the, uh, the reference, uh, in terms of the densities that perhaps you know, we need more information on what's happening with trout movement patterns and, and their movement patterns in response. Uh, now, once again, we're fortunate that there's a PhD candidate named Aaron Spires at Dalhousie that is working on uh, trout movement patterns in the system as well. So hopefully we'll get a little bit more information on that as his, his, his work concludes. Uh, I'll end off with uh, just a few thank yous. Uh, my funders, Nova Scotia Transportation Infrastructure Renewal, Habitat, Santa Max, 
uh, DFO, uh, Nova Scotia Liquor Corporation Adopt Stream Program, and Lang Sam Conservation Foundation all contributed to this project. So we, we thank them for their, with their, their financial support. Uh, and then there's many people that I have to personally thank for uh, their, their assistance in, in, with this project. And with that, I will uh, take any questions that people might have. Thank you very much, Chris. That was excellent. Really interesting. Um, and uh, yes, now we will open the floor to questions. So as a reminder, you can either raise your hand to ask a question and you'll be unmuted, or you can type in a question and Michelle will read it out loud for you. Darla, I'm going to copy and paste the questions since I'm the echo problem. Okay, so I'll, put them in so I'll read them out loud. So, so I, see I see the first, the first question, question right here right now from Peter Cronin. Thanks, Peter. Um, so the question from Peter Cronin is, if I recall from the map, did the wetland enter the water course between the reference and the restored sites? If so, was the retention time of the wetland reduced by highway construction and thus contributed to the greater decline in water temperatures compared to the reference site? Um, that, that's yeah. You are correct uh, in that that is the that is the the wetland was positioned uh, in between the uh, reference and the restored, uh, and certainly yes, the that, that 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 is quite quite possible as to what was going on. So uh, that 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 whole the development on the uh, on the uh, on the of that marsh and the effect of that marsh, which was supposed to be relatively minimal, uh, and turned out to be a little bit more substantial than than, than was originally planned. Um, Th that certainly is a compounding variable, and that, that's one of these other things that's unfortunate that just uh, really takes away from the strength of our ability to make uh, very strong conclusions. Hi there, Chris. Uh, it's, uh, I see uh, that I'm uh, unmuted here. It's uh, Todd Dupuy with ASF in Charlottetown. Um, I, by looking at the uh, some of the pictures of the stream, uh, I note that it, there seems to be a stark lack of large organic debris in, in in the river. It looks a lot like PEI, where you have uh, a real a really altered um, riparian zone, so that the forest cover uh, is very young, and uh, and uh, I think as a result the volume and type of large organic debris that's coming into the system has been altered and we find in PEI where we where we have a, a lack of Lord a large organic debris we have less fish and we have less leaf litter being trapped and used locally did you look at uh, that that fact uh, that there's uh, there doesn't seem to be a, a, an overabundance of large organic debris and did you add any large organic debris in the, in the study area to see what the impact would be uh, yeah, we, we, we certainly made notes and observations on on what was there, um, and uh, yeah, we, we 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 it was certainly very much altered. This all the land, especially in the restored site, there was all old pasture land, uh, and uh, so every uh, every tree of substantial size had been and chopped down. And so as you can see, I put it on the screen there. Now now you can see that it was relatively young, in terms of that. Um, there was uh, there was I didn't show any of the pictures of it, but in a few of the locations there was a fair uh, you know we were running into a fair number of large organic debris. Uh, it, as I said, we didn't sort of quantify it; we just sort of assessed it. But uh, it was not something that we did, other than uh, you know the addition of uh, in-stream structures such as digger logs and stuff like that. But we didn't go through and add in coarse woody debris. Uh, as part of the restoration uh, strategy, what we did do is, is there was a, a very extensive um, uh, planting program. Uh, I forget the total of trees, but it was in the several of thousands of trees that we planted uh, along uh, along that area to uh, attempt to start to regenerate uh, that entire uh, entire region. Hey, thanks. I have a question for you now from Jeff Giffen. Uh, could the reduction in trout densities after restoration be attributed to the reduction in minnows given that trout feed on other small fish species? Um, that certainly is um, possible that uh, that's that, that's what's going on. Um, as I say, once once you you factor that um, 
the minnow population, that large catch that we got, if you take that out of the analysis, uh, then we actually see an overall increase in minnows. Uh, as I say, it was not something we we're willing to do just because of the, the concern that you know maybe we are taking out something that's there. Uh, but if we take that that one large catch out or those two large catches out, certainly uh, the effect gets uh, substantially reduced in terms of uh, how what the loss of minnow was. Um, and the other reason that um, that I'm I'd be a little hesitant to to, to think that that's what's happening is is that uh, the minnow community was much much smaller. Uh, significantly smaller uh, at the reference site and we did see increases uh, of the trout there. So th it was those two factors that were leading us to believe that we we're probably seeing more uh, just the mobility of the trout, that they were just moving around in the system uh, and because of uh, various activities they, they, they were, um, uh, we were just, we, we are hypothesizing, obviously we don't know that uh, that's what's going on, but certainly that's something that needs to be investigated a little bit more. What is the effect of the trout? Uh, and uh, I can say that the inland fisheries uh, study, that 10-year study I alluded to at the end, uh, we're really going to be looking at that, what the move of trout patterns and, uh, and use of uh, trout with response to restoration. So hopefully we'll be able to answer that a little bit more conclusively uh, in the coming years. All right. Well, I think that's the last of our questions. And given the time, I think we'll wrap things up. Uh, a huge thank you to Chris. Thank you very much. Your presentation was fascinating. Um, also, thank you to everyone to, for participating today and also for all of your troubleshooting help at the beginning of the presentation, especially to Kevin Garraway, who figured out our solution. Um, today is going to be the last presentation of our series. Um, it's our grand finale. Uh, in this, which is the first year of, of what's been a pilot series. We're currently planning for our second session of webinars that will be starting up again this fall. And we're very eager to have suggestions for presentation topics or speakers. And we're going to be sending out an email note shortly to request your input. But in the meantime, feel free to send either myself or Michelle um, a message uh, if you have any suggestions for topics or speakers. Please don't hesitate um, to, to let us know if you have some ideas. So as soon as our speaker schedule is finalized, like last year, we'll be sending it out by email and it will also be posted on our websites. Um, and yes, just to wrap up, thank you again so much everyone.